Okay, let's start in. Got a fairly large agenda today. And I wanted to remind you that next week we're moving on to air quality. So check your syllabus and uh, uh, read the material for section next week. And today I want to talk about two principles in law, uh, one being preemption and the other being defamation, and to give you a couple of case histories. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to start out talking about Bates v. Dow, and then I want to talk about uh, two cases, uh, one on product disparagement, uh, and the other <clears throat> uh, one is uh, known as the Alar case, uh, and another is a case that was brought by the Texas Cattlemen's Association against Oprah Winfrey. And I'll show you a couple of video clips of that. First of all, preemption has its origin in the Constitution. Uh, within the Supremacy Clause, it states, this Constitution and the laws of the U.S. shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. So that within air quality law, within uh, pesticide management law, within pharmaceutical law, uh, tobacco law, uh, occupational law, uh, states are prohibited from adopting uh, standards, certain standards, uh, that are uh, different than the federal government. And the purpose behind this is not to create a, uh, a patchwork uh, quilt that uh, is really comprised of non-uniform standards so that uh, when corporations wish to trade goods uh, or provide services across state boundaries, they basically have the same expectations. It's often applied to uh, situations that are risky or products that are risky uh, and <clears throat> the failure to warn is often a, a key question and we'll raise that uh, in the case today. With respect to pesticides, uh, Congress traditionally deferred to states uh, to regulate threats to health and safety. Uh, but since 1970, uh, it's exercised its power uh, to preempt state or local regulation in a number of areas, particularly uh, with respect to warning labels on pesticides. So there are a variety of theories of damage recovery. So if you imagine that, uh, uh, say, uh, someone comes to your home and uh, uh, promises to give you a green lawn uh, by applying fertilizers and, and uh, insecticides, and uh, all of a sudden you, know, you notice an acrid uh, uh, taste in your well water, and uh, also your, your uh, uh, children start uh, to feel awkward or, or strange uh, and you find out that the chemicals that were applied were neurotoxic substances uh, and <clears throat> what, what are your rights? Uh, basically you could argue that we have, uh, we have a uh, percussion uh, section out there in the, in the, uh, on the street throwing I think uh, rocks or bricks into one of these big metal barrels so I apologize for that. So you can imagine yourself uh, in a situation where you conclude that federal law didn't protect you against that. Uh, you feel like you've been damaged. It's going to cost you money to either drill a new well or to put in filtration equipment. And what about uh, the health effects on your family? Uh, so <clears throat> there, there are a variety of theories of damage recovery. And one is uh, that uh, the failure to warn provides a justification for seeking uh, recovery of damages. So. <clears throat> Uh, remember what I uh, argued about the, the uh, difficulty that uh, most people have in understanding warning labels, uh, the, the difficulty of taking complicated scientific information and, and reducing it in a way that would make it intelligible and, and make you capable of knowing you know, how you should behave in order to uh, prevent risk. For example, uh, should, you have, should you be responsible to know that you have sandy soils? and that your well is a shallow well and it's an old well and the casing is cracked? I mean, are you really responsible to know that? Uh, should that information be on a warning label? Negligence is another theory for recovery. So was the, uh, the product uh, uh, made in a negligent way or was it used in a negligent way? How about design defects? Uh, listening to uh, Good Morning America uh, today, uh, I was uh, intrigued by litigation that uh, is, is growing. Uh, class action suits uh, against Toyota because of their accelerator pad catching or uh, brake defects. So uh, some, some defect in, in production or, or design uh, that leads to a higher level, higher concentration of, of risk or hazard uh, and subsequent damage. 
How about uh, failure to disclose incident reports? So that uh, Dow Chemical Company was, was fined nearly $800,000 uh, because it had been uh, <coughs> uh, reported to Dow by a variety of uh, uh, families that, uh, that they felt that uh, they had uh, medical problems that were associated with using their products. And <coughs> uh, they were required under federal pesticide law to report those incidents uh, back to the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, and they did not do so within the uh, time limit. There was a, a significant delay. So the failure to disclose incident reports, and again with the, the uh, auto defects that uh, we're, we're uh, witnessing in the, in the press and, and uh, in the showrooms today, uh, the same issue applies. So when did the corporation know that the pedals stuck uh, or that the brake system uh, was, was uh, not working correctly? So the failure to, uh, to report back to, to uh, government agencies that have regulatory responsibilities, whether it's pharmaceuticals or, or cars or, or pesticides or cosmetics or foods, uh, these generally carry significant penalties. And <clears throat> because of preemption that's built into pesticide law and uh, air quality law, et cetera, uh, states have often denied access to courts uh, to use these theories of recovery to, to uh, secure compensation. So the, the, the state courts have often uh, uh, not agreed to hear the cases. Uh, this is why uh, Bates v. Dow is so important. Uh, Bates is a case in which uh, 29 peanut growers in, in uh, Texas uh, alleged that Dow AgroSciences uh, had, had produced a, a chemical called Strongarm. Uh, Strongarm they claim damaged their peanut plants uh, back in the year 2000. And the, play, the, the pesticide label itself claimed that uh, use of strong arm is recommended in all areas where peanuts are grown. Now, when it was used in the Texas uh, peanut farmland where the soils exceeded a pH of 7.2, it damaged both the peanut crop and it failed to control the weeds. So uh, the the uh, activity of this chemical is mediated by uh, the acidity of the soil. Uh, and by 2001, EPA had approved a new label for the chemical, including a new warning, do not apply strong arm uh, to soils with a pH of 7.2 or greater. So this case was decided in 2005. Uh, this label was in, in force uh, for four years before the, uh, the, the decision date. So eventually, uh, the case wound its way up to the Supreme Court. And this is, quite, uh, this is quite a feat in many instances. Uh, claims that are brought in state courts uh, do not make their way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, it can often take uh, decades or even a half a century before uh, a case is, is uh, believed to be appropriate for judicial review by the highest court in the country. So they found that Congress surely would have expressed its intent more clearly if it had meant to deprive injured parties of a long available form of compensation. Moreover, this history emphasizes the importance of providing an incentive to manufacturers to use the utmost care in distributing inher inherently dangerous items. In other words, the Supreme Court was looking at uh, the, these uh, uh, lawsuits to uh, seek recovery as really a last resort. So it represents the failure of federal law. It represents the failure of state law or local law to offer sufficient uh, environmental protection or protection of public health. So what's a damaged party to do? What are you going to do if uh, you've been damaged? Well, you, you probably would consider litigation. So the Supreme Court uh, continued, it seems likely, unlikely that Congress considered a relatively obscure uh, provision like Section 136 of VB, uh, which is the preemption clause, to give pesticide manufacturers virtual immunity from certain forms of tort liability. And we've been pointed to no evidence that such tort suits lead led to a crazy quilt of FIFRA, federal pesticide law standards, uh, or otherwise created any real hardship for manufacturers or EPA. So the argument that you would have an unevil, un, uneven uh, a regulatory playing field among the states uh, had no substance to it. Or that the manufacturers would be uh, damaged significantly by, uh, uh, <clears throat> by uh, these claims because uh, A, they're expensive, uh, they're, they're time consuming, and uh, few people actually uh, uh, have the resources or capacity to bring uh, the, the lawsuits. 
So central questions today really uh, will involve a question of uh, freedom of speech and when is it appropriate to limit speech about uh, environmental and health hazards, uh, intellectual property rights, you know, who should own the right uh, to uh, knowledge of risk, should it be, uh, 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 should corporations be capable of holding that as a, uh, uh, a secret or are they, uh, should they be obligated to disclose that to, uh, to the public in the form of a warning label or a disclosure of an incident report? <clears throat> what should the standard of proof be uh, and how should the falsity of a statement uh, be judged? The falsity of a statement on a label or the falsity of a statement made by a party uh, that is challenging a corporation? that uh, they were damaged by exposure to their product. Uh, and where should the burden of proof lie? Should the burden of proof lie with a plaintiff to prove the, the falsity of criticism or the defendant to prove uh, truth of, of criticism? And to, to uh, uh, explore this area of product disparagement uh, more fully, I want you to consider one case. <clears throat> this is a case of a, of a chemical known as Alar uh, that uh, <clears throat> you probably did not experience uh, but uh, uh, it was in wide use in the United States and, and uh, in different parts of the world uh, back in the 1980s and early 1990s. And it was used on apples. And it was used on apple uh, orchards basically to cause uh, stem thickening uh, so it would hold the apple on the tree longer and it would keep the apple from falling down and, and uh, getting bruised. So it would maintain the commercial quality and the grade of the apple. <clears throat> and it would also uh, cause uniform ripening. Uniform ripening is important because you don't want part of a tree, perhaps that's facing the sunshine, uh, to have apples that are ripe and then the, 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 uh, all the uh, apples that are uh, on the north side of the tree uh, in more shade uh, that would remain green. So it, it uh, provided economic advantage to, to orchard owners uh, in, in a variety of ways. It's <clears throat> this is a systemic compound, which is interesting. It means that it's absorbed up through the plant roots itself into the plant tissue. So uh, you may think that uh, uh, some residues are only on the surface of a, a fruit or a vegetable, and if you peel it or if you wash it, you could get rid of it. Here's an example of, of a compound that uh, uh, that would not uh, be helpful for. It's not easy to detect uh, when this chemical was being reviewed and became a, 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 public, uh, a public target uh, <coughs> uh, for criticism of, of its manufacturer. Uh, I went up to uh, uh, the state of Massachusetts because the state of Massachusetts was trying to figure out if they were going to ban the compound as it was detected increasingly in foods. And I went to their laboratories, their state uh, laboratories, and they had not even developed a detection method yet. Speaking to their analytic chemists, they, couldn't, they didn't even know how to find this in foods. So think about that for a minute. What that means is that the government approved uh, the use of a chemical on certain crops when it knew that uh, there was no accepted method for detecting it in, uh, in the food or in, in processed forms of the food uh, or in water supplies if it, if it happened to contaminate water supplies. So th that's, that's quite curious and it might uh, give you some ideas uh, about uh, uh, prior requirements before introducing new technologies. So <clears throat> it gives, uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> it, it has an unusual characteristic it produces uh, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine, UDMH, which is also a space shuttle rocket fuel, but only under conditions where the chemical is heated. Now, where would uh, food be heated? Well, it's commonly heated when it's, uh, when it's processed uh, or when it's pasteurized. So uh, when you take an apple and you, you grind it up and, and uh, uh, you squeeze all the juice out of it to make apple juice, uh, it's commonly heated up for the purposes of killing bacteria. <laughs> and, and uh, protecting human health. Apple juice uh, uh, at, in the 1980s was also exploding into the marketplace in, in part because of, of different uh, packaging technologies. So uh, it used to be uh, available in, in large glass bottles, uh, but the, the advent of juice boxes uh, so that uh, children would take uh, uh, these, these flavored juices to school on a routine basis and in uh, really small cardboard and plastic containers, it cost caused apple juice consumption to skyrocket. So that apple juice, uh, within a matter of a decade, uh, became one of the more heavily consumed foods uh, by young children. <clears throat> so it was introduced by Unaroyal in 1966 uh, and registered by the Department of Agriculture because EPA wasn't uh, in existence until 1970. And in 1973, uh, it was found to, to produce cancer in, in mice. Uh, between 1977 and 78, 
the National Cancer Institute uh, uh, found that that study was credible and they, they conducted their own studies uh, that found carcinogenic effects in animals. You know, raising the question, how should we look at data uh, from animal testing? And what, what should we infer from that about uh, human health risk? Well, during conservative political administrations, uh, we've tended as a society not to worry too much about uh, these, these uh, low-level cancer risks in the food supply. But remember that at this point in time, the Delaney Clause in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act was in place that had what was called uh, the de minimis risk standard built into it. <clears throat> so it also had the Food and Drug Administration that was interpreting the de minimis standard to allow low levels of risk in the, in the food supply. <clears throat> so EPA concluded eventually in 1980 that it was carcinogenic uh, and then negotiated uh, with Uniroyal for several years and that produced no action. Uh, in 1985, they found that uh, both ALR, which is the parent compound and the, the metabolite, the UDMH, was a probable human carcinogen. So this is the next step up in the level of concern. <clears throat> it's not just an animal carcinogen, it's probable human. Uh, the next step up, by the way, is known human carcinogen. Uh, and there are uh, more than uh, 100 now uh, uh, compounds that are, are characterized as known hum human carcinogens, uh, such as benzene and uh, a 1,3-butadiene, which exists in diesel exhaust and uh, other uh, combustion uh, <coughs> situations, such as in wood smoke or, or uh, <coughs> virtually any time fossil fuel is, is uh, uh, being combusted. And in 1985, uh, some feedback from their own scientific advisory panel uh, raised questions about uh, the quality of the data. Can you actually calculate a cancer risk? So what is the threat? Uh, <coughs> And what can publicly be stated about that threat? Well, the Natural Resources Defense Council, one of our largest environmental groups, uh, conducted their own analysis of, of kids' exposure, recognizing that kids were eating a lot of apples and applesauce and, and drinking a lot of apple juice. Uh, it was a very common uh, a drink to be served to uh, infants in, in place of, of infant formula or, or milk. And has the EPA violated the, the public trust? So let me see if I can get this going. This is a 60 Minutes report that was prepared on this uh, uh, controversy so that the Natural Resources Defense Council uh, brought their study to 60 Minutes and asked them, would you like to release this information on your show? And uh, the, the uh, uh, answer was yes. Cosmetic Act that says quite clearly if this, if this chemical 
cause a tumor in laboratory animals, not malignant tumors, any kind of tumors, it's supposed to be pulled off the market. Jack Moore, the deputy administrator of the EPA, says that he'd like to take it off the market, but he's afraid that the manufacturer, the Euro oil, that makes this chemical, could successfully sue the EPA and get them. So let them sue. That's his job. He's with the Environmental Protection Agency. Go to a cancer ward at any children's hospital in this country. See these balls wasting away kids, and then make a decision as to whether the risk uh, uh, the benefit. Kids are at a high risk from UDMH because they drink so much apple juice. The average preschooler drinks 18 times more apple juice than his or her mother. If those apples were treated with dimenazide, the cancer risk is perilously high. Janet Hathaway is the senior attorney for the Natural Resources Defense Council. What we're talking about is a cancer-causing agent used on food that EPA knows is going to cause cancer for thousands of children over their lifetime. Uniroyal Chemical, which makes dimenazide under the trade name Alar, declined to be interviewed for this report. But in a letter, they said any risk from dimenazide or UDMH, if it exists, is negligible. Nonetheless, preliminary results from Uniroyal's own study already show high levels of cancer in laboratory animals. Janet Hathaway's organization, the Natural Resources Defense Council, has just completed the most careful study yet on the effect of dimenazide and seven other cancer-causing pesticides in the food children eat. Just when we say pesticide, what we're finding is that the risk of developing cancer is approximately 250 times what EPA says is the acceptable level of cancer in our population. 250 times? That's right. What, what that means is that over a lifetime, one child out of every 4,000 or so of our preschoolers will develop cancer just from the EPA pesticide. And the EPA says acceptable limit is one out of? One out of a million they say is acceptable. Are they scaring people needlessly? Are they feeding them? Well, there's, there's, there's no question that if the risk is, is greater than, than uh, the one in a million calculation, it's a cost of concern to this agency. Now, you, you've had a chance to look at the NRDC study. It says children are being exposed to a pesticide risk several hundred times greater than what the agency says is acceptable. Risk unacceptable? Yes. Magnitude of risk is less by our calculation than the magnitude of risk. Dr. John Gray, a professor of I'm sorry, this will take just one second. So think about what Janet Hathaway, the senior attorney, just said. Over a lifetime, one child out of every 4,000 or so of our preschoolers will develop cancer from just these eight pesticides. Think about the wording, the phrasing, uh, very carefully. This is quantitative risk assessment. It's loaded with uncertainty from uh, many different sources. You're, uh, <clears throat> you're forced to infer from animal evidence. You're forced to, to uh, uh, understand uh, the, the pattern of exposure, uh, how the compound might behave inside the human body. Uh, then she said, Alar, the most potent ca cancer-causing agent in our food supply is a substance sprayed on apples to keep them on the trees longer. Uh, and what we're talking about is a cancer-causing agent used on food that EPA knows is going to cause cancer for thousands of children. Uh, over their lifetime. These are, are uh, statements uh, of, of certainty uh, that uh, caused uh, widespread fear in the population. Senator Joe Lieberman uh, spoke to me uh, uh, during this situation and he said he walked immediately after watching 60 Minutes over to his refrigerator. He took out his jar of apple juice uh, and dumped it down the drain and started uh, making phone calls. This happened uh, all over the country as millions of people had, had witnessed this. Uh, Jack Moore, uh, who you saw, the acting EPA administrator, said uh, <clears throat> that the evidence, yes, uh, that he relied upon was suitable for a decision to say that Alar indeed was a carcinogen. Uh, and the media re reaction was really quite striking. Uh, all of the major media outlets picked this story up, <clears throat> Newsweek, etc. cetera. Uh, Donahue, on the Donahue show, uh, he said, don't look now, but we're poisoning our kids. Uh, the consumer reaction was really quite uh, 
rapid and uh, devastating for the Apple industry. Uh, Apple product sales dropped 30% in a month, uh, particularly on apple juice. School boards in New York and Virginia and California stopped serving apples in their lunch programs. Uh, growers claimed losses of $250 million and engaged, uh, they engaged uh, in a lawsuit against both 60 Minutes as well as the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, within a matter of, of six months, the economic uh, uh, concerns were so high that uh, the industry itself was begging EPA to please regulate and prohibit the use of this chemical. Now, that's really quite striking. So that you've got uh, uh, really a kind of a very different type of regulatory theory here. Uh, what is regulation doing? Uh, it's really providing a sense of legitimacy to manufacturers of different kinds of products. So that if you know that a uh, chemical or a product, it, it could be a food, it could be a car, uh, if you know that it's been reviewed by, by a regulatory agency, uh, that act of regulation uh, really constitutes certification of that product's uh, utility and also its safety in the marketplace. So the fact that the, uh, uh, the, the growers and the grocery stores and even Uniroyal asked EPA to move quickly uh, so that the economic damage uh, would be limited and consumer confidence could be restored, uh, particularly because this product was not used on all Apple products. So it really is a form of symbolic politics, which I think is quite striking. Uh, <clears throat> so that uh, regardless of whether or not the regulations are health protective, uh, they create a sense of legitimacy of products and services in the marketplace. Uh, so that in one sense, uh, our, <clears throat> our corporations need these regulations uh, so that uh, they, they uh, create consumer confidence. So the Washington apple growers, <clears throat> there are 4,700 of them, claim that well, there was no evidence linking Allard to human cancer, and the animal evidence was insufficient, uh, and they <clears throat> called this a uh, product disparagement or a trade libel case. Uh, and in this situation, the growers faced the burden of proof. So they needed to prove that the, the statements were uh, made knowingly uh, to be false, the statements were deliberately made to induce monetary damage, and this is a form <clears throat> of trade libel law defamation. Uh, so there are, there are several forms of, of uh, libel, slander, and sedition. Libel, uh, the definition, is defamation through print materials. Slander is oral defamation. Uh, in the English common law tradition, libel and private enterprise uh, generally uh, found favorably to uh, plaintiffs. And sedition, you'll recall, is any political criticism that tended to diminish respect for government laws and public officials. The common law definition of libel uh, was decided uh, uh, by a, a famous court case in 1933. It co covers all written communications that tend to expose one to public hatred, shame, obloquy, uh, contumely, uh, odium, contempt, ridicule, aversion, ostracism, degradation, or disgrace, and to induce an evil opinion uh, of one in the minds of right-thinking persons and to deprive one of their confidence and friendly intercourse in society. Well, in this case, the Ninth Circuit uh, uh, Court of Appeals uh, found uh, on the absence of human studies that the fact that there have been no studies conducted specifically on the cancer risks to children from deminazide, one of the arguments on the part of the industry, uh, does nothing to disprove the conclusion that if children consume more of a carcinogenic substance than do adults, they are at higher risk for contracting cancer. So what's interesting about this comment uh, by the appellate court is that they're not looking for proof that this chemical caused cancer in, in children. They're looking for elevated cancer risk. And on the falsity of the statements, uh, a product disparagement plaintiff has the burden of proving uh, the falsity. Uh, and this statement refers to individuals, uh, not to the, any overall message. And if a jury were given the task of interpreting the uncertainty of a message, uh, it raises the specter of a chilling effect on speech. So uh, <clears throat> think about uh, the relationship between uh, uh, <clears throat> this type of a court case and the uh, freedom of the individual to express themselves or express their opinion about the dangers of different products or, or human behaviors. Uh, so this case was decided by the Ninth Circuit fundamentally on a, a First Amendment uh, choice, referring back to a, a famous New York uh, Times versus Sullivan case in 1964, where Sullivan, who was a police commissioner in Alabama, uh, brought a libel action against four African American clergy and the New York Times. Uh, the Times had uh, published an advertisement back in 1960 
uh, in support of, of uh, civil rights uh, activism among students, uh, a struggle for the right to vote, uh, a legal defense of Martin Luther King against a, a perjury charge, and charges of repressive police misconduct, including false statements. And the trial uh, judge had instructed the jury uh, that the advertisement was liable, libelous, that uh, uh, legal injury was implied, uh, that falsity and malice are presumed, and that punitive damages should be awarded. So that in this case, uh, the Supreme Court found that constitutionally deficient, uh, it was constitutionally deficient for failure to safeguard freedom of speech in the press uh, required by the First and the Fourteenth Amendment. And debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, wide open, and that it may well include vehement, caustic, and sharp attacks on government and public officials. <clears throat> With respect to actual malice, because in order to, to find uh, disparagement uh, <coughs> or liability in this situation, uh, <coughs> there's a need to demonstrate actual malice. The constitutional guarantees require a federal rule that prohibits, prohibits a public official from recovering damages for defamatory falsehood relating to his official conduct unless he proves that the statement was made with actual malice. What's malice? Well, it's with knowledge that uh, the claim was false when it was made, or with reckless disregard of whether it was fa false, and the burden of demonstrating the falsity uh, rests on the plaintiff. Now, <clears throat> this seems to give uh, the media a fairly wide berth in the kinds of claims that they can make. In the wake of this case, uh, Many states passed what are thought of now and, and uh, labeled as veggie libel laws. So that rather than uh, placing the burden on a, uh, uh, a plaintiff to demonstrate uh, uh, the falsity of the statement, uh, they place the burden on the individual that makes the claim of significant risk or hazard. So there are many states that uh, uh, have adopted the, the, the statutory uh, change. And <clears throat> what this means is that it opens the way for slap suits. Uh, what is a slap suit? It basically is a suit that intimidates people uh, from making claims about uh, uh, the, the quality of the environment or, or causes of its loss or uh, uh, subsequent health damages. <clears throat> so uh, among these 20 or so states that have adopted these laws, for example, now I, I will not give a lecture uh, where I'm making a claim of risk. Uh, so that what might be thought of as a chilling effect on free speech in a way. So if I'm, uh, uh, say, uh, being taped on a radio show, that radio show is broadcast in a, in a, uh, a state where, where uh, one of these veggie libel laws exists that would place the burden uh, on me to demonstrate the proof uh, that uh, my claim is, is uh, uh, backed up by high quality science, uh, that will pull me into court. Uh, it will cost me uh, uh, thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars even, uh, to, to uh, uh, defend myself. So that the influence of, of this, this form of, of law uh, is really quite striking. What also is interesting about this, this evolution of state uh, laws that, that uh, reverse the burden of proof uh, is that clearly uh, it's been found by the Supreme Court as being uh, an unconstitutional shift in the burden. Yet none of these state laws have been taken up to the Supreme Court for, for uh, consideration. So think, think about that. Uh, these laws have been in place now for, for well over a decade, and uh, uh, <coughs> all environmental groups, uh, all public health interest groups understand the nature of these laws, and they're all very self-conscious about the nature of the claims that they make. Now, <coughs> I want to show you this. Uh, Oprah Winfrey uh, had, a ho had hosted a show on mad cow disease. Mad cow disease is a, uh, an illness that is caused by a prion and believed to be associated uh, with beef that are fed uh, other cattle parts uh, in their, in their uh, cattle meal. So <clears throat> Winfrey hosted uh, Howard Lyman, uh, who described the process of, of uh, slaughterhouses and uh, beef rendering and how the parts were ground up uh, and then uh, put into animal feed and fed back in the United States to, uh, to cattle that were sold for food. Uh, and this was the the uh, mechanism that uh, uh, he and others believed had, had caused the outbreak of mad cow disease in, in Great Britain. Now there are laws that prevent that uh, from happening, but at this point in time, this represents another uh, rather interesting case on, on uh, product disparagement.
cannot locate the server. Give me one second here. I've lost my internet connection, so we're on hold for a moment. Apology for that delay. On the stage, to the left of me, mother whose granddaughter is dying of a human form of mad cow disease in England. To the right of me, a guy from the National Cattle and Beef Association points his name and says, Here's a man who believes within 10 years we could have a disease that make AIDS look like a common cold. And I said, Absolutely. And she said, That's a strong statement. I said, Oprah. We have 100,000 cows a year, fine at night, busy in the morning. We round them up, grind them up, turn them into feed, feed them back to other cows. We go out and collect roadkill, deer, elk, possum, raccoons, scrape them up off of the street, grind them up, feed them back to cows. And then we take pets, city of Los Angeles, 200 tons of pets full of chemicals that were used to kill them. 200 tons a month are ground up, turned into feed, and fed back to our food animals. This time, Oprah's eyes are as big as saucers. I know that I've got it. She turns around and looks at the guy from the National Cattle and Beef Association and says, Dr. Weber, are we feeding cows to cows? And that's what he had to say. He said, well, you know, uh, there's a limited amount of that going on. I believe that about 95% of the cattle fed in factory feedlots are eating the remains of other animals. And the next thing out of Oprah's mouth, damn it, gets us sued. Oprah says, that just stops me calling. I will never again eat a burger. Now she didn't say, I think the meat's infected. She didn't say to the millions of viewers, you shouldn't eat them. She just said, that stops me cold. I will never again eat a burger. Now, I knew when I went on that show that 13 states had a thing called the Food Disparagement Law. The Food Disparagement Law says that it's against the law to say something you know to be false about a perishable commodity. To say anything I thought to be false. I told the truth. Well, we were taping the show. It took about two hours. When we got done taping the show, I walked up to Oprah and I said to her, I said, hey, Oprah, give me 10 minutes. I'll get you off of chicken. Oprah looked at me and said, only one animal a day. <laughs> so I went about my business. A couple of weeks later, I got a call and they said, do you realize you're being sued with Oprah Winfrey and a hundred production by a group of Texas cattlemen? And I said, no, can I put you on hold? I raced into my library, I inventoried my vegetarian cookbook. I knew those cattlemen wanted those vegetarian cookbooks bad. I went back and said, I can't talk to you right now, I'm going to put in a call to Oprah. I called Oprah and left a message and I said, Oprah, if we lose this suit, I'm going to throw in my vegetarian cookbooks. you got to put up the money. Well, we end up getting sued in Amarillo, Texas. I don't know how many of you have ever been to Amarillo, Texas. 
It's not the end of the world, but it's clearly visible to me. <laughs> if you're going to give the world a camera, you take the hose to Amarillo, Texas. The largest employer in Amarillo, Texas happens to be the slaughter facility killing cattle. Bumper stickers all over town said the, the only bad cow in Texas is named Oprah. I knew we were in trouble, and I went to saw my lawyer, and I said to him, we need a change of venue. There is no way in the world that we can win here in Amarillo. So we filed with the judge for a change of venue. We walk in, there's the judge, 72-year-old lady, a tough old heifer. We asked for a change of venue. She picks up the hammer, flops it down, says, motion denied. Bring in the jury pool. They brought 140 people in. You never saw so many hats, boots, and belt buckles in all your life. I said to my lawyer, we need to file an appeal because there's no in the world that we're going to win here. At the end of the day, we had 12 jurors absolutely steeped in the cattle culture. My lawyer, he looks at me and he says, they're going to call you to the stand tomorrow. He said, the first question they're going to ask you is whether or not you are a vegetarian. I said, I can handle that. He said, you damn well better to lose. Sure enough, the next day they call me to the stand. I'm on the stand. The plaintiff's attorney is looking at me, laughing and giggling. And he says, I, I can't hardly say this. <laughs> and Mr. Weinberg, is it true that you are <laughs> vegetarian. And I looked at the jury and said, I will not apologize for something that has saved my life. Never again in that trial did they ever ask me about I was a vegetarian. But they asked me every question you can imagine. I'm on the stand and the lawyer looks at me and he says, Mr. Lyon, has anybody ever called you irresponsible? I said, yes. My lawyer is sitting over there going, no, 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 no. The plaintiff's attorney thinks he's found the key to the Gordian gun. And he looks at me and he says, who? I said, my wife. And the jury's over there, been there, done that. We were in that courtroom for six weeks. At the end of six weeks, that jury found Oprah, Harpo Production, and myself not liable. The plaintiffs went out of their tree. They could not imagine that that jury, that homegrown jury, could find out-of-towners not liable and they appeal with the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. We spent a year in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and at the end of the year, they came down with a unanimous panel decision that Oprah, Harper Production, and myself were not liable. And then, they wrote an opinion that said everything that Lyon said on the show was true and the truth is not actionable. The cattleman couldn't stand that ask for a rehearing. It was denied. And then the cattleman got together and went to state court and filed suit against Oprah, Harper Production, and myself in state court. Thank God I did not live in Texas. I was able to move it from state court to federal court. They appealed that. We spent six years, hundreds of thousands of dollars of my money, defending it to tell the truth. At the end of six years, the judge finally threw out the case with prejudice, which meant the jury or the plaintiffs could not refile the case that statute of limitations that were out. So at the end of six years, hundreds of thousands of dollars of funding indicators were standing up and telling the truth. So the core of this problem is the way that these state veggie libel laws shift the burden of proof. 
So under federal law, it's really clear that uh, <coughs> the Cattlemen's Association was under the, the uh, burden of proof to demonstrate the statement was knowingly false and delivered with malice, with the intent to harm. But under state law, uh, Oprah's burden was to demonstrate that the statement is true with reasonable certainty. So I'll leave you with uh, one thought on this and uh, the importance of fashioning law in a way that would protect uh, free speech and open access to knowledge of risk and opinions on the part of experts. Uh, Justice Powell in 1974 on truth and free speech, there's no such thing as a false idea no matter how pernicious an opinion may seem. We depend on its correction, uh, not on the conscience of judges and juries, but on the competition of other ideas. So that's it for today. Have a great weekend.